you have been studying psychology from last two years and there is a big question why do we study psychology and how can we be a good psychologist how we can stand apart as a real psychologist in contrast to a pseudo psychologist so those are some of the questions that we would address in this lecture to begin with what psychology actually involves so psychology i can say is a interdisciplinary field which is not only service oriented but it is also application oriented understanding and uh, dealing with human behavior is one of the major characteristics of understanding psychological problems unless and until you interact with a client you cannot understand what the psychological problem is and then it is also scientific in nature and there is a well defined method for research for example if we say a person has depressive tendencies or if a person has addictive tendencies all of these tendencies if we want to de-addict a person who is addicted or to bring out a personality who is depressive in nature what are the psychological techniques which are involved also the role of psychologist is not confined to this it is focusing on congruency congruency means looking to the past and understanding the present for example let's say i have a friend in front of me and one day i meet my friend and say you don't look well today what does that mean otherwise the friend looks good that means there is a harmony between the past and the present so since you know about the normal situations you can identify that the situation is not normal and therefore trained counselors would always be able to maintain congruency a very very important characteristic for psychologist now as a psychologist what are three important skills which are required the first is behavior modification that means as i mentioned if a person is addicted you want to de-addict the person behavior modification is required if a person consumes excess of excess of alcohol or smoking then you want to shift that person towards a normal routine life and that requires behavior modification so one is behavior modification the next is assessment of individual differences that means if you are a educational counselor there are 20 students in your classroom all of those 20 won't perform equally well there are individual differences some of those could be gifted children the others could be retarded children a good psychologist would assess the difference between them and then proceed further with the works and the next is wherever required counseling and guidance should be provided so those are some of the basic things that psychologists are actually involved so psychologists primarily have interest in other people and they are always willing to provide help by using their knowledge so in order to make psychologists work easy what is a good thing that a client should do the client should share their history unbiasedly they should share their socio cultural environment and also uh, the personality as a psychologist what skills are required good proficiency able to have flexibility and dexterity with the skills and that comes with and with either training or experience so training and experience a good combination rather now how do you identify who is a real psychologist versus who is a fake psychologist pseudo means false so we also call this as pseudo psychologist now three things which are important definitely one is the educational background the person is a qualified psychologist or not so that's the primary thing the second is whether the person had an apt amount of training so we call it professional training and the third is the experience so far how many cases the person has dealt with and how many cases have been successfully uh, done through so all this is the factors that help you identify a real psychologist versus a pseudo psychologist now there are many people who claim that i am able to understand what you say i i think you are going in the right direction and they give you all kind of advices so that is not what is 
psychologist so psychologist must have an educational background a professional training and an experience in providing and dealing with the services now to be a successful psychologist what do you require it's not just reading books it's beyond reading books three types of skills what are those general skills observational skills and specific skills general skills are generic they are applied across all branches of psychology it could be uh, related to industrial psychology it could be related to organizational psychology it could be related to uh, behavioral psychology or even for medical perspective it requires interpersonal skill and personal skills which we would understand in a while the next is specific skills specific skills means if i am an educational counselor i need to understand how a gifted child versus a retarded child would behave if i am a counselor for industries i need to understand how laborers uh, would behave in a certain uh, situation and what are the wages or the benefits they must be uh, the emoluments there that they must get and the, their response is based on that so that's a specific skill whether it is related to industries whether it is related to education whether it is related to mental disorders or so on and so forth the next is observation keen observation is what we focus on when i say keen observation what does this mean a psychologist should be very very attentive and very very capturing must have the ability to scrutinize the physical settings now what do i mean when i say physical settings whether the person is sitting in a dull background with all lights off it can be an indicative of a depressive personality in contrast to that a person is in a well lighted room happy and jolly so scrutinizing the physical settings around a person the next is capturing atmosphere that means understanding what kind of relation the person has with the near and dear ones a person is a extrovert personality who is a highly talkative person or an introvert personality who does not talk very well with people but is involved with the uh, with their own task and then their behavior and their interactions with their family members with their friends with their uh, workplace colleagues and so on also watch and listen very very carefully the acts and the the speak or the speech of the client so to understand the psychology of the client it is very important to watch and listen the behaviors very very carefully coming on to the specific skills now specific skills we say four important specific skills we said it would vary based on what kind of work you are doing so psychological skills getting to know about person is definitely one of the skills which is required specifically for clinical therapeutic settings then communication skills communication skills focus on three important thing whether i am able to speak with my client i am a good psychologist but i am not able to interact with my client no point the next is listening if i am not able to listen what the client wants to say and i keep on speaking do this do this do this makes no point the next is body language what the client is trying to tell is will explain from numerous non verbal cues and that is what we call as body language how the person sits how the person uh, person's gestures as the facial movements the eye contact all of these would help you understand what the person actually wants to bring to you the last is the counseling skills now you know everything about your client but definitely you want to bring in behavior modification for the client so what is required a good counseling skill to have a good counseling skill there should be authenticity you should be trustworthy you should be able to get uh, the confidence of the client If I am talking to you and you are not confident that I am speaking correct, you won't remain on this video. You will move to the next one. So authenticity is what is required. The next is positive regards. Positive regards about the 
counselor that means that i have good faith and the counselor would help me sail through my problems and the next is empathy empathy and sympathy two very very different things if i say i am on the road side and i see a poor child sitting on the road and i have a sympathy towards the poor child and i give him a packet of biscuit that we call it as a sympathy what is empathy empathy is i understand what that child is suffering from i try to keep myself in place of that child and feel how the life would be so that is empathy empathy and sympathy very very different terms need to be very very careful and as a counselor you need to be empathetic you need to keep yourself in position of that person and think how that person would be feeling at that point of time specifically this aspect of empathy is required more when there is a ptsd a post traumatic stress disorder after a trauma there is a significant stress in the mind of person uh, there, this could be due to any natural calamity any natural disaster uh, accident or a uh, untimely event in life so all of those require empathy and therefore counseling skills become very very important now to be a good counselor there has to be a numerous set of skills which are required and we call this as intellectual and personal skills which we focused in the section on general skills so we initially classified our content into general skills observational skills and specific skills under general skills we mentioned that there is intellectual and personal skills so we are on that again within intellectual and personal skills what is important the first one is interpersonal that means how well you are able to get acquainted with others interpersonal between, between two persons the next is cognitive how well you can understand and that is important if you don't understand how would you solve the problem so to solve the problem you need to understand the problem and therefore cognition is required the next is being affective having an emotional control and tolerance is important so emotional control and tolerance is part of effective aspect the next is a personality a person as a personality you should be open to new ideas uh be ethical in practice be honest and you must be a personality who can provide courage to a person who is already in stress so developing yourself as a personality becomes important the next is being expressive that means your idea should be well communicated i am telling you something and if you are not able to comprehend it definitely no point taking this lecture and the same thing is with the counseling if i am counseling you and you are not able to understand what i am saying there is no point you are attending the counseling session so being expressive is important the next is reflective reflective means you examine yourself consider this to be a reflection of mirror so you uh, basically communicate and examine you consider your own uh, motives your own behavior your own attitude and then try to explain and be sensitive to the behavior the motives and the emotions of others and that we call it as reflective and finally personal maintaining your uh, personality as a part of personal skill is important so time management discipline dedication ethics all of those fall into the last category so these are some of the skills which are required now sensitivity to diversity is what we say when it comes to psychology as a psychologist you have to be sensitive and diverse because you can have clients coming in from different racial groups different ethnic background different socio economic background different socio cultural background so knowledge about various things knowledge about self ability to work efficiently with people from varied background getting yourself well adjusted and timely adjusted with the surroundings getting sensitive to your preferences as well as to others preferences and 
focusing well on respecting your cultural beliefs as well as the client's cultural beliefs is important now two important things that we focus under the process through which psychological skills are refined as mentioned one is observation and the other is interviewing so let's talk about these two one by one the first one is a naturalistic observation i am aspire there keeping myself here and here is a person all happy singing in one of the gardens now this is a naturalistic observation that means you are observing a person closely but the person is unaware about it the person is actually in his own natural surroundings doing what he wants to and you are monitoring each and every action of the person and this is a naturalistic observation i can give you another good idea let's say i want to uh, take an analysis of the shopping mall so what i can do is i can walk into a shopping mall i can see all the stores and analyze how the things are and uh, what do the people say before the purchase how do the shopkeepers react to the customer and i can take note of all of those things around and that is a naturalistic observation going into the natural phenomena and observing the things making comparison of one shop versus another shop and the different aspects within the mall the next is participant observation i am no more aspire there i am with this person participating in if he is singing i would be enjoying the song if he is dancing probably i would be participating with the person and this is what we call as a participant observation so taking the example back of a shopping mall now i am no more a person who is just strolling in the shopping mall and seeing what others are doing i am now a person in one of the shops and a customer is with me how would i interact and what would be uh, the things that would be discussed is part of the participant behavior so i want to get a first hand information of the system and therefore i am part of the system and this we call it as a participant observation now observation comes with its own advantage and disadvantage the major disadvantage is i am a person so definitely i would have some views some feelings and therefore a high chance that there can be a biasness probably i would enjoy with that person if i like singing if i don't like singing probably i would be biased towards that person so first important thing is biasness one of the major disadvantages the next major disadvantage is since i am again a person there could be a probability that i can get influenced by someone and de influenced in another scenario so if the person is really a good singer and talks a lot about all the kinds of singers all the music bands of the world i might get influenced but on the other hand there could be a scenario where the person could de influence me by singing and being monotonous probably and that is how we understand that observation has its disadvantage but despite this disadvantage there are advantages advantage is you are studying it in the natural surrounding original thing people are doing what they are wanting to do and therefore there are less chances of modifications in the behavior the next is interview now looking for a job definitely you would have to face an interview what are three elements of interview opening of an interview body of an interview and closing of an interview opening of an interview we see is a point where the interviewer now interviewer and interviewee interviewer is a person who takes the interview and interviewee is a person who is actually being interviewed so this is here the person is a interviewee and this person is taking the interview so he is the interviewer now what is the characteristic of opening of the interviewer opening of the interview the interviewer would get you acquainted with the surrounding make you relax tell you the goals why this interview is about and help you feel comfortable the next is body of the interview it is the basis the most important thing which would decide whether you are selected for the interview or rejected for the interview you are into a job or you are not into a job so it is we call as the heart of the interview now this body of the interview 
what kind of questions are asked we would come to that in a while but this is the main thing where we have a series of questions and when there are sets of questions which are already pre-prepared we call these as schedules so the psychologist or the interviewer would come with a set of questions one after the other you would have a huge number of questions some would be easy some would be hard some would be long some would be short so uh, amalgamation of all kind of questions some would be objective some would be subjective in nature the last is closing of the interview Closing it of the interview is the point where there is a sum up, a end of the discussion. But this is a point where interviewer usually asks interviewee that if you have any comments, any feedbacks, or uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come back and let us know. Now, in the body of the questions or the body of the interview, what kind of questions are asked? One can be a direct question. What was your last job? This is a direct question. You have a direct answer. If there was a last job, you would name it. If no, you would say no. The next is open-ended question. Uh, what kind of skills are you comfortable with in computing or what kind of soft skills are you familiar with? So it's an open-ended question. You can name all the skills you know. Closed-ended question. Do you know programming? So you would say yes or no. So it's a close ended. It's not an open ended where you can bring in all the kind of answers. So it can be closed ended, open ended, direct. Clear so far? The next is bipolar. Bipolar is a kind of question which is very close to a closed ended question, but it requires a quick response and the response has only two aspects. Yes or no? No other option. In a closed ended question, there can be a answer besides yes and no also. For example, I can ask you, uh, do you think knowledge of psychology is important for this job? So you can say psychology is important. Psychology is okay to do. Psychology is not at all important. So there can be gradations of answers in a closed question. Bipolar, just two options like a like a digital system, 0 and 1, the binary computing system we can say. Uh, bipolar have yes and no. That means, did you like your uh, last job? Yes or no? So it's a bipolar question. The next is leading question. Leading question is a question that encourages you to respond in favor of a particular answer. That means, why don't you feel that you are in favor of getting uh, a job before you start uh, getting an internship before you start your job? So this is a kind of leading question. It encourages a response in favor of a specific answer. So you are trying to motivate a person to answer that the person, yes, wants to look for a job. But if the person is looking for a job, why didn't the person try it for a couple of internship before getting a job? And this is a leading question. The next is a mirror question. Mirror question is reflecting a person what he or she is based on what they want to explain themselves. So, for example, you can say, um, I worked so hard, but I was not able to get a good job. Now, explain this, what has happened to you. So, this is a kind of mirror question. I keep myself in a position that if I am unsuccessful, I am not able to get a job. What would be my feeling? So, the, the interviewee would now express the feelings on their own end. And this is how we create mirror questions. So, these are various types of questions which are usually asked in the interview. Coming on to the next thing is testing. Sometimes there are a fixed set of tests which are conducted in psychology and we call this as psychological tests. Now, these tests have been made through uh, numerous standardizations before and therefore are highly objective because they have been experimented and re-experimented a number of times before finally getting them into action. 
The next is they have a scientific orientation. Their scores have been assessed and uh, the understanding about that psychological test has been found. And finally, they are standardized and their interpretations are well read so far. Now, if you are into an organization, if you are into a business, you would focus on various activities. For example, if you are applying for a post of stenographer, what is important? Your typing speed. So as a test, you would be given a sheet of paper and you would be asked to type. And then probably the time in which you type is recorded. So this is one of the ways under which you would be tested. Then there could be a same scenario where the stenographer is given the same text, but with certain uh, music around, certain noise around, and then the performance is recorded. So what is understood by this is how well you are able to perform under, under a stressful situation, under a divided attention situation and so on. The next is in this assessment, what is important? So here are some of the things that we focus on. The first is whether we are able to implement various methods of evaluation across different groups and sets of people. We gather the data from those. We develop a psychometric approach and understand whether our assessment method was really applicable, was good or not. If there are any issues related to data, any issues related to interviewing, those are checked. The results are integrated and finally they are uh, put into interpretation and diagnosed. Once diagnosed, the strengths and the limitations of the assessment are given forward and they can be taken into further account for development of the test results. Now, what are the factors which govern a psychological test? First of all, we need to be very, very clear why the test is there. What is the use of this test? Why it has to be conducted? The next is the target audience. That means whether it is for children, whether it is for adolescents, for adults or so far. The next is validity of the test. What is meant by validity? Validity is on the basis of what it is said, whether it measures to claim that or not. For example, if I say this is an IQ test, and this is an intelligence test and I do it for a set of people who are looking for a personality test. It is not valid. It is valid if it is meant only to test intelligence, not personality, because we are trying to test intelligence out of it. So for any test, three important characteristics. One is validity, which we talked about, whether it is valid or not, reliable. That means the same test is conducted today, tomorrow. Uh, objective or long answer within uh, two different time frames within two different ways the results are possibly similar and then we say the test is reliable it should not be that I am taking the test today on the same person the results are 100 on 100 the next day the results are 20 on 100, 100 uh, 20 out of 100 so that means this test is not reliable there is some problem with the test because the person is the same there is just a gap of one day the person probably cannot learn so much or cannot deteriorate so much in a day so reliability whether it holds true and how much error it is generating and the last one is standardization of a test standardization means for whom it is constructed if this is a test which is in english language i cannot conduct this test to a french speaking population if this is a test which is in chinese language i cannot conduct it to a hindi speaking population so it should be standardized standardized for what set it is meant for whether it is meant for all english speaking people whether it is verbal it has letters it has words or it is just pictures and graphics which everyone can understand whether it is meant for rural people whether it is meant for urban people uh, whether literacy is a major parameter which is uh, part of that test or not then is the time of the test how long the test is the scores how those would be calculated whether those scores have been averaged across certain norms uh, then the special factors taken into account and finally the limitations of the test so those are some of the criteria that we understand as part of the psychological test the next topic that we understand is communication. What I am doing right now, I am definitely communicating with you. So this process of communication is 
a very interesting process there are four important aspects related to it first it is continuous it never stops when i say it never stops what does it mean our brain remains active throughout whether i am sleeping or i am awake there are series of thoughts running in my mind and therefore communication is continuous it is reversible if i have spoken something it is done it is finished i cannot take it back and i can only say sorry it was wrong and move forward so it is reversible so just don't stamp out think before you speak the next is interactive it is interactive that means i took this lecture you have something in mind it could be questions it could be doubts it could be clarifications it could be objections you would raise the, those in the comments and that would be an interaction i would go through the comment and reply to your answers or if it is a live class probably you would ask the question and i would answer the question the next is communication is dynamic that means it is a constantly evolving process today i am in a very good mood so my communication could be a little different probably tomorrow i am not in that good mood so my communication could be a little different so communication can change it is dynamic in nature but yes a lot of fluctuations if they require an assistance of a psychologist the next is communication process can be accidental that means you are just driving and suddenly you saw an accident and there was a police on the spot you are being inquired so it's accidental it's all of the sudden you don't plan what you want to speak and what you saw you just speak so it is accidental the next is expressive where you bring out your heart you bring out your emotions you speak what you feel from within so if you are very sensitive about certain issue and you want that to happen uh you are one of the social changers for that then your communication would be highly expressive the next is rhetorical that means that results from a specific goal of a communicator with that specific goal in mind there is the communication that moves forward what can be the type of communication i communicate by myself by seeing in a mirror probably after before coming to this class there was a rehearsal and we call this as a intra personal communication that means communicating with yourself intra within yourself the next is interpersonal so one of the students come to see guidance from me and i am talking to that student or a psychologist talking to a client could be a good example of interpersonal communication to or a group set of people involved which basically interact on making certain decisions or improving certain criteria and the last one is public speaking so if i am speaking right now and it is being seen by 20 or 1000 audience what does this mean this is a public communication so this communication is between more than two persons and we call this as a public communication where it's it can be either face to face live it could be through uh, social media platforms through televisions or through public broadcasting means and this is the three basic types of communication now when a communication starts there are interesting processes uh, let's take a very simple example of this uh, setting i am speaking about communication so i am the source and the sender what i am saying is being encoded so there is an in encoding that happens and that is whatever things i want to convey are converted into a message packet and that message packet is being sent through the channel probably youtube here and through this channel it is being decoded on the other end so at your end you are able to hear what the words i am saying and that is the process of decoding and finally who is the receiver you are the receiver who is listening to what i am saying now there are two fields one is the sender's field so this is my field of experience i am recording this video here and sending it to you what is your field yours is a receiver's field you are trying to decode if there is a network issue there could be buffering if no network issue the video would run smooth there could be problem of resolution sometimes so on and so forth so that is where the decoding is taken into account so there can be noise in this channel 
in this channel when we are talking about probably youtube here what could be the noise the noise could be internet connectivity poor bandwidth uh, issues of buffering the video could be uh, uh, stopping in between something like that so those are all what we call as noise the disturbances that can occur and then once you have got through what i was trying to communicate you provide a feedback so this is a feedback loop how does this feedback comes through it could be either through comments or through emails or through messages whatsoever the channel could be so in the communication process there is a sender there is a receiver the message is encoded by the send from the sender to the receiver the receiver decodes the message intermittently there can be noise in the channel we call this as a channel of communication there can be noise in the channel and once the receiver receives it if the receiver receives it well the feedback is good if there is error then there can be other feedbacks that can be taken into account okay so what are the components of communication we would focus on eight important components the first is speaking as i said if i am standing here and i am not speaking you would probably move to the next video so speaking an important part now speaking is a use of symbols which is coming in a package but that package is a meaningful package for you if it is meaningful you would listen if not then no point so communication is successful only when that package is meaningful then is the reception now reception could be through your sense organs you would probably watch the video if you are not interested you would probably just listen to the audio so through all your sense organs there is reception and finally you listen listening is a very important act it determines your academic success it determines your employment achievements and it determines your personal happiness how well you can receive the message how attentive you are how non judgmental patient you are and you are able to analyze and respond to the speaker so listening is important then is attention how long are you able to concentrate let's say you are watching this video right now and there is a music playing in one side your sister dancing it other side uh, probably your neighbors fighting on the third side so what happens there is a divided attention so attention needs to be very very concentrated and as is an important part of communication so the same video if you are watching in a peaceful environment you are able to absorb 90% of it if you are watching this in a divided environment you are able to absorb only 30% of it so communication component attention is very very important then is paraphrasing summarizing i can bring in the whole ncert book 30 pages here and i can summarize this in just 30 minutes so paraphrasing is what is important how well you can summarize your ideas then give meaning to the ideas rather than just putting a lot of theory for you huge big sentences and letting examples to you if i am able to bring in more meaning attached to it definitely it is much more better then culture across culture if the same concept is being understood by you or another person definitely my communication is much more successful and the body language you are not here so i cannot tell you right now but if this was a live class if this was a real classroom i can well understand from the body language of the students whether they are able to enjoy the class understand the class or they are just sleeping right now so that is what is body language so four components that we talked in the beginning speaking listening reception and attention and four here paraphrasing meaning culture and body language all of this must work with congruency as we mentioned before congruency is nothing a harmony between verbal and non verbal communication and between the past and the present so how well you are able to understand and compare uh, things prior with the current class so for example if one of my class that you have watched before 
did not make well sense to you probably you would before coming to this class have a prior men's mindset that i don't want to watch this lecture this is boring or if you have watched a lecture before which you enjoyed probably you would have a mindset that i would enjoy this lecture as well and therefore there is a congruency this congruency comes from your past experience and you are able to compare the same phenomena with the past with the present and it involves both verbal and non verbal cues the next is counseling as a psychologist you are there to help someone now someone should be there who is asking for the help if there is no one asking for the help whom you would help so you are ready to help someone is asking for the help your willingness your willingness to help and finally how well you can understand and plan so this counseling requires a well planning a planning how to proceed forward how you are able to respond to the feeling of others uh, a basic acceptance from the side of the client the client should accept that he wants to interact he or she wants to interact and therefore we say counseling is totally voluntary in nature you cannot force someone to actually get into counseling the next is transmitting and receiving the verbal and the non verbal messages during this process but there are certain myths about counseling the myths are uh, it's not just uh, uh, the myths that you need to uh, break actually is that counseling is not just giving information or giving advice or it's not about something which is meant to change your attitude it is more than that so a good counselor actually has four important qualities as mentioned before as well we'll focus this the, those again first is empathy not sympathy you are able to understand person's feeling from their perspective and this is what we call as empathy remember again we differentiated between empathy and sympathy so as a counselor you should be highly empathetic you should be able to keep yourself in the position of the client and understand the feelings the next is authenticity authenticity means a perception about yourself a confidence a truth level that you hold with yourself and that you are consistent with your values with your ethics with your beliefs the next is paraphrasing paraphrasing means summarizing as a counselor you should be able to bring the gist of what is to be done very very quickly not huge lectures a uh, whole day in and day out small quick gist of what has to be done the next is positive regard positive regard focuses on bringing in good freedom of expression good freedom of expression between you and your client would help in uh, streamlining the counseling session i have a very good example here let's say uh, all of us definitely fear something or the other so there can be a very good act as in counselor if there is a educational counseling session what can be done is students in the classroom can be asked to write down their fear on a sheet of paper and each person can just write what they actually fear about without their names and keep all of those fears in a big parcel now you would be randomly picking all the chits which have the fears written and then people would discuss that if this is the fear what can be done what can be the possible ways out of it how you can actually get rid of this fear and that is one of the activities which is uh done as a counseling session in the schools in institutions to confront the fear the next is as a counselor there are to be certain ethics which are to be maintained what are those ethics the information that the client is sharing with you is is a private information unless and until the client is ready to make it public so maintaining the privacy of the client's information the client's personal life is your duty the next is any legal issues across the range of professionalism that it has is 
again part of the ethics of counseling system the ethical codes the professional code of conduct uh, the knowledge the regulations should be well known before you actually move into the field and there should always be a professional assertiveness assertiveness implying that you would be able to successfully help your client get rid of the problem and that is the most important thing because unless and until as a counselor you are confident that a person would get rid of the problem there is no way out you can help the person get rid out of the problem so that is what an effective counselor means so in this session we focused on how to develop your psychological skills practically this was a uh, uh, one of the last chapters of your session we would be covering many more interesting lectures in psychology in coming days stay tuned stay safe have a wonderful day